This is CBC Here and Now. This is where I sleep. Every night, I be hungry. Someday, I will get a house. He has been trying to find housing for five years, but a man from Maine is still homeless as the area struggles with affordable housing. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. Abilie Ikasuk lives on the streets of the community in remote Labrador, and he finds himself caught in a housing crisis that plagues indigenous communities right across the country. They're grappling to find affordable housing. And when Here and Now's Jacob Barker met up with this man, he was sleeping outside in a makeshift tent just before a major storm. A storm is moving through Nain on an early September evening. Outside is not a good place to lie down at night. This is where I sleep. That's just what Abeli Ikasik has been doing, but not on this night. It's wet. My sleeping bag is wet. And my boots and my sneakers are wet. What are you going to do tonight? Oh, don't know yet. Ikasik has nowhere to call home. He does have work, but doesn't make much. My living is um, like working in a hotel, making pocket money so I can eat and smoke. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes drinks. <laughs> he mourns his parents. Staying sober sometimes leads to tears. Every night I drink. Every night. Because thinking about my dad too much. That's why I drink every night. Pain, he says he works through in his own way. When I'm alone, I bow and I feel better. Can I bow? Ah! Why does that make you feel better, Abli? After when we bow, we feel better. It's good feeling after you bow, let the dial out, bow. When you're walking alone, just bow. It helps. He's back on the street. Help is what friends like Richard Kent are trying to do. He's living under a step, which is to me is shameful. He's worried about Ikasek being stuck outside without shelter. Oh, he lived in, uh, in tents. He lived under uh, people's basements, crawl spaces. He lived in our containers. He lived under scaffolding. Whenever he can make a place to lie down his head at night, that's where he lay down. And I'm afraid one of these days I'm going to find him and he's going to be dead. So Kent is working to get Ikasik into a shelter for the winter. Well, I just want to see him off the street. Ikasik too wants off the street. He wants a home, but it took him time to ask for help. With you all people out there who's homeless like me, keep trying. Don't be scared. Just talk. Be brave. Don't be scared to talk. Let it out. That's what I'm doing. I'm talking. Well, here now is Jacob Barker joins us now from Happy Valley Goose Bay. So, Jacob, you checked in on Abilie's situation again. What are you finding out? Well, Anthony, I haven't spoken with Abilie directly, but I did speak with his friend Richard, and he says that Abilie is now sleeping in a truck. But the good news is that the shelter here in Happy Valley Goose Bay, there's an emergency shelter uh, that will be taking him in for the winter months. As for the larger picture, the Nunatsiwu government did pass a housing act uh, this past spring, which is aimed at fixing what is dubbed uh, a housing crisis in the region. There are no houses available right now, accor according to the housing authority there in Nain. Uh, it's expensive and it takes time to build houses. Uh, but Kent says that he's happy that he got Abley into, or well, Abley did get into housing uh, for the winter months, and he's hoping that there's a more permanent sol uh, solution down the road. Anthony? It's been nearly five years since Lyndon Butler walked down the stairs of Supreme Court a free man. Tonight, he's back behind bars. That story coming up on Here and Now. Oh, 
just uh, went through some warm weather this weekend. Certainly uh, most regions seeing temperatures in the 20 degree range. Much different story today though. We do have a little bit of a disturbance moving through tonight. That's going to bring some rain heavier along the south coast. Clearing trend in behind that thanks to a ridge of high pressure. And then we've got a couple of low pressure systems in play in the coming days. That's going to make a nor'easter a pretty strong one uh, as we head into Thursday and moving into Friday. But I'll have all those details coming up. A repeat sexual offender is back in jail tonight just days after being released under strict conditions. 33 year old Matthew Twine has a history of exposing himself in public and in a rare move, police went to court to have nearly 30 conditions placed on Twine, believing that he is likely to reoffend. Twine has a 20 page long criminal record with offenses on the east and west coasts of the island. He was most recently sentenced to more than two years in jail for repeatedly exposing himself to teenage girls at a St. John's dance studio, and he was carrying a hunting knife at the time. Twine allegedly breached a condition of his release by being near Memorial University, an area that he wasn't supposed to be. Well, nearly five years ago, Lyndon Butler was acquitted of murder, and tonight, He's back behind bars. Police allege that they found the 29-year-old with a handgun. Here now's Ariana Kellen reports. It's 2014 and Lyndon Butler walks away a free man with plans to go to law school. It could have been much different. Butler and Philip Pinn were accused in the 2011 shooting death of their friend Nick Windsor. The high emotion, high profile trial captured the province's attention as it shed light on the criminal underground in St. John's. After weeks of testimony, the jury found Butler not guilty. Today, nearly five years later, a more disheveled Butler is back in handcuffs, again for an alleged weapons-related crime. Police say they arrested him on Friday during a traffic sting dubbed Operation Impact. Instead of finding a speeder, they say they found a handgun, either loaded or with ammunition close by, in a vehicle. Butler is facing eight charges in total. They involve allegedly carrying a handgun and ammunition without a license for a dangerous purpose and also while on conditions not to do so. While Butler was acquitted in Nick Windsor's death, he does have past convictions for things like importing or delivering a firearm, careless use of a firearm and drug trafficking. That's why he was on a firearms ban to begin with. He's being represented by well-known lawyer and former politician Jerome Kennedy. Butler is back for a bail hearing on Thursday. Ariana Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Well, if you've ever driven around in circles at the Health Sciences parking lot in St. John's, this next story will be of interest to you. A St. John's man says it was so bad one day last week that he missed his appointment even though he has a special parking permit. Eastern Health says it's trying to solve the parking problems with a new valet-style parking service, a service that's already making a difference. Here now, Cease Hare explains. Finding parking at the Health Sciences can be a source of stress and frustration for parents and their families. Being forced to drive around in circles for that elusive parking space chews up a lot of time, and sometimes people are late for their appointments, or worse, miss them altogether. That's what happened to George Miminas last Tuesday, despite getting there 40 minutes early. So I missed the appointment, and um, that's bad for me. That's bad for the person who had the appointment uh, with me, a physiotherapist, and that's bad for the system as well. And to make matters worse, he couldn't even park, even though he has a Blue Zone permit. That, he says, needs to be fixed. And because he's missed appointments in the past, due to a lack of parking, Miminas, who's a professor at Munn, sometimes calls a taxi to get him at work. Cabbies tell him he's not alone. And they tell me that people park at the, are not as lucky as me to have a parking lot here, and so they park at the Avalon Mall and they call a taxi and go to the uh, health sciences and then another taxi to go back to their car. So that's an extra um, expense for patients. In response to parking problems, Eastern Health started an overflow system in September to create an additional 45 parking spaces. When the gated lot gets full, attendants send circling drivers to the overflow area where they park and leave their keys. The attendants block other vehicles, and when the blocked drivers want to leave, the other vehicle is moved. 
This is a common form of parking in big centers, like in Toronto, if you're heading to a Jays or a Leafs game. We've only been running this program for about uh, three weeks. Um, we have successfully stacked uh, 400 clients and visitor parking um, vehicles within the lot. Eastern Health says its blue zone parking spaces at the Health Sciences is twice what's required by law. And the Mimina's experience, while unfortunate, is also an opportunity. Whether that's better communication of where the individuals can park to, or whether that's um, increasing the capacity there because we don't, maybe we don't have enough. Maybe those number of blue zones isn't enough and we need to increase that capacity. But by giving that feedback, that's valuable to us and we take that very seriously and we will look to make those improvements. Eastern Health says there'll be more parking spaces soon near the Janeway and those along with this overflow system will hopefully ease the parking pain here. Cease here, CBC News. St. John's. Well, Newfoundland Power says heat pump sales are red hot. Speaking at a PUB hearing on electricity rate mitigation, the company said interest in heat pumps has jumped dramatically. Newfoundland Power said about 10,000 customers were using them in 2014. Compare that to more than 37,000 in 2018. The company's CEO says it's a direct response to the Muskrat Falls project's cost overruns. After the announcement in 2017 that electricity rates might double, that Nalcor announcement, within a year or so, we saw a 57% increase in the number of heat pump installations in this province. That's a pretty remarkable uptake for a single year. That's a pretty remarkable increase. It was about three times what we had seen prior to that. So our customers were clearly reacting, in our view, to the Muskrat Falls announcement that their rates would double and their reaction was we're going to use less. Well if you're looking for a job most people go the old way and they submit a resume but there's a new contest in St. John's that has people picking up their cameras. Job hunters are recording minute-long videos and then submitting them to the St. John's Board of Trade. The videos are all going to get voted on and the top three candidates get to win a chance to pitch themselves in person at the organization's biggest annual event, the Business Excellence Awards. Now, typically, six or 700 movers and shakers attend that event. Really, it provides a way that people can show off their personality and, and people can see what they're really like. And, uh, you know, oftentimes people have the skills and you can see that on paper, but it's the attitude and, and uh, how they connect and resonate with people. And that's what a, a video helps to do. Now, there's no guaranteed job offer, but there will be lots of potential bosses in the room, as well as some other prizes. All the videos are due on Friday. Now, Patia is going to be the super fan of the Raptors and represent Raptors, and I became the face of the Raptors. Hey, let's go! Ahead on Here and Now, you're going to meet that face, the Raptors super fan in St. John's. That story, after the break.
All right, everybody's sort of checking an extra belt notch after uh, <laughs> that weekend of plenty. And weather-wise, uh, it was interesting. I mean, it was sunny to begin the holiday weekend and a little warmer on Sunday. Yeah, Sunday was beautiful. Right, a little wetter too, but some places. But all yeah. in all, pretty good weekend. I mean, yeah, it's very it was. mild. It was. It was super yeah. mild. And a number of areas actually saw some record-breaking temperatures, which mm -hmm. was uh, kind of nice. Tacked on another 20-degree day here in St. John's, yeah. which uh, a grand total of 30 five days, uh, which is still well below uh, what we should be seeing, which is about 53 days a year. But anyway, okay. I guess we're past that. But we'll take a look at the temperatures today. Much different story. Eight degrees in St. John's uh, this afternoon, 11 in Badger, and those temperatures back down to the single digits up through uh, portions of Labrador as well. We're you saw temperatures on Friday and uh, parts of Saturday too into the 20 degree range. So much different. Uh, and then this afternoon, or currently still sitting at four degrees for Lab City, seven in St. John's and up through St. Anthony, you're sitting at about six degrees right now. So uh, here's the setup. We do have some showers moving along the west coast right now. A little bit of a warm front and a station or uh, occluded front rather moving through. Uh, we're going to see some showers continue through the overnight tonight as uh, the fronts keep pushing a little bit and lifting a little bit further north and east. But in behind that, we do have a ridge of high pressure in place, which means things should clear out. So by tomorrow morning, we're going to see some rain heavy at times along the south coast. Could pick up anywhere from 10 to about 20 millimeters of rain. Otherwise, uh, 2 to 5 millimeters generally. Central and parts of the west coast, likely around Corner Brook, uh, you could see between 5 to 10 millimeters of rain, and then we're looking at that for most of the Avalon as well. Northern portions of the Avalon for sure will uh, see somewhere between 5 to 10 millimeters of rain by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. So here's a look at the temperatures. They're going to dip another degree or two for most of us. Those winds generally out of the south. You can see breezy for the south coast as well, 20 to about 40 kilometers per hour. West Coast generally light winds, uh, 5 to 15 kilometers per hour, and uh, St. Anthony sitting around 5 degrees. Best chance of seeing some snow will actually be for Lab West overnight tonight with flurries going down to zero degrees. Two for Happy Valley Goose Bay, you're looking at the chance of showers and really all the way towards the coast as uh, we see a little bit of that system. So there goes that rain. Uh, and then in behind that, we're going to see some clearing skies through the day tomorrow. Again, slight chance of some light snow or flurries for Lab West and portions of northern uh, Labrador will see that chance of showers and or flurries through the day as well. But overall, we're just looking at a mix of sun and cloud through the day once the showers move off. So eastern uh, Newfoundland and the island or the uh, Avalon will likely see those showers in the morning. Then clearing skies a little bit warmer than today. Should be sitting around 12 to 14 degrees with those winds out of the south, 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Through central, you'll start to see the sun a lot earlier in the day. The trend is to clear, so 13 for Grand Falls winds are certainly along the west coast. You'll see clear skies. 11 degrees for Corner Brook, 12 for Gross Moor, and slight chance of a few showers in the mix there as well. St. Anthony, 11 degrees, those winds about 20 to 40 kilometers per hour as well. Plenty of sunshine for Mary's Harbor, Cartwright as well, 12 to 14 degrees. And then again, staying cool, unfortunately, for uh, Lab City, Churchill Falls, around 3 degrees. And then uh, those winds along the coast, 7 to 8 degrees for you but uh, around 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. So that's a look at tomorrow's forecast as we head uh, towards Thursday and Friday. A warm up, but a nor'easter is on the way. I'll have all the details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. The St. John's Edge roster is going to look very different when the new season kicks off after Christmas. Star player Glenn Big Baby Davis isn't returning and he's not the only one. Hometown favorite Carl English, even he says he may not play this season either. Only two players from the basketball team's last season are coming back. Glenn Davis, a former NBA player, says the team told them they couldn't afford to pay a salary. But head coach Steve Marcus says Big Baby's big personality also contributed to the team's decision. Other players not returning include Des Lee, Jaron Skeet, and Satnam Singh. The Edge's first game is in Moncton just after Christmas on December 27th. Well, staying with sports, the official superfan of the Toronto Raptors is in St. John's today to speak to members of the Board of Trade. So, what's the connection between a superfan and the business community? Well, we're going to find out because here now is Carolyn Stokes joins us now uh, to talk about this. So, just who is this superfan dude? Well, Anthony, his name is Nav Batia, and besides Drake, and you know who Drake is, right? 
Yes, sorry, <laughs> well, I had to think about it. Yeah. You know, the super famous rapper. Besides yeah. Drake, he is the most famous Toronto Raptors fan. And yes, he is a super fan, but he's also an immigrant and he's a success story. In 1984, he came to Canada to escape the persecution of Sikhs in India. He struggled to find work and was eventually hired as a car salesman. But now he has three dealerships of his own and employs nearly 200 people. This afternoon, I met with Nav Batia and some of his fans after he spoke with members of the St. John's Board of Trade. Hey, let's go! Well, my story is this uh, immigrant coming with basically nothing 35 years, 34 years ago to this country. And uh, uh, even with those challenges, I don't use the word discriminations and all that. It's a negative word. But with all those challenges, if I've been able to do it, Anybody can do it. In 95, when the Raptors came, I didn't have any hobby. I was just a workaholic. I will go to work in the morning, 7.30, 8 o'clock, come from work at 11 o'clock, have dinner and basically sleep. And then when the Raptors came, I said, I'm going to try this, this game. You know, I used to watch it on the TV with Michael Jordan and Larry Bird and all uh, Dr. J. And I used to, it was very, you know, it was exciting. I said, I'm going to try with two tickets. So I bought two tickets and uh, kept on going to, and the very first day I fell in love with the game. It is the fastest game on this earth. It's the most entertaining game on this earth. And uh, I became a fan of basketball and the Raptors. And then I attended every game, even when they were losing by 30 points in the fourth quarter, I was there till the end. I was the first one to come and the last one to leave kind of a thing. And uh, in 98, 99 season, Isaiah Thomas, the vice president, of the Raptors just pulled me one day inside the court in the middle of the court and gave me a jersey and presented me and announced it that Nav Bhatia is going to be the super fan of the Raptors and represent Raptors and I became the face of the Raptors. Wow. So that's how the super fan thing came out. I was a little girl and I remember seeing Nav on the screen and being excited to see somebody who looked like me at a NBA event. It was amazing and he was right there. I grew up in Toronto so it was a great opportunity to bring my boys to hear about the Raptors and the Superfan and just to hear about diversity. What did you learn from it? Perfect. Give me a big hug. I love the Raptors and what's better than watching the Superfan of the Raptors. <laughs> and what did Nav say to you? He said that we should keep going and not stop believing in ourselves. He was saying that like keep pushing harder and yeah, like that, stay in school and all that. It's pretty cool. Even just bringing in the super fan, Nav, and others, you know, who have these great stories, it also helps people meet and realize what, you know, immigrants have to offer. And of course, in Newfoundland, it's only the last few years that we've seen some increased immigration. And it's great for this story to be told and for people that have a chance to get to know um, people like Nav on a personal level coming to our province to speak to us. And how it ties into the Board of Trade is that obviously immigration is one of our key concerns for our demographics. We need increased population not only to support you know workforce needs but um, our tax base, everything with the continued economy of the province and keeping it healthy and growing, we need a workforce. And as we all know, our numbers are decreasing. So immigration is a key, key focus of the board in how to sustain our economy and improve the health of our province. Newfoundland is beautiful. I had heard about it, but today, for the last 24 hours, I have felt it. And it's a very beautiful place. It's a hidden treasure for Canada. I believe that when people find out all around the world about Newfoundland, I think sooner or later in the next five, ten years, this is going to economically benefit from all the immigration. And it will be good for Newfoundland and it will be good for the people also because amazing people. My experience with, I had heard about them, but now here, when I'm here, I'm feeling it. It's true. Newfoundlanders are the best. Well, if you're curious about how many games he's attended over the years, I know I was curious. He says he hasn't missed a single Raptors game, home game, in 24 years. So he's been courtside for about 1,000 games. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Here Now. We have an update or a recap of what's happening with that massive salmon cleanup on the south coast that we've been covering. Well, late Friday, heading into the long weekend, Northern Harvest Sea Farms held a news conference announcing that there were many more dead fish in Fortune Bay than previously believed. You remember Fisheries Minister Jerry Byrne? No, I've heard reports that there could be upwards of 25 million fish that were uh, impacted. I've heard reports the Atlantic Salmon Federation, for example, put out uh, some social media that uh, upwards of five to six million fish were impacted. We know that's not true. The total stocking density of all the sites that were impacted uh, was no greater than two million fish, and the number of mortalities is not two million. It is less than that. Well, was Jerry Byrne last week said he was less than two million, speaking with CBC Radio as the broadcast and assuring the public of that figure. Now, Byrne has since suspended most of Northern Harvest permits. Happened on Friday, closing the fish farm door after the fish are gone. Now, he didn't have many options. The minister was not available for an interview today, and his office is considering an interview request for the coming days. But there are still many questions about the timing of all this that remain unanswered. For instance, the company didn't reveal it had fish dying en masse until the 23rd of September, but the rapid suffocation of those fish started almost three weeks earlier on the 2nd. Now, Jerry Byrne knew there was a problem, having been notified sometime in early September, but instead of telling the public, he urged the company to share that information. Well, just how long this information was withheld matters because the two federal agencies involved in a potential cleanup were either DFO or Environment Canada Climate Change, and they weren't notified until October 8th, five weeks after the fish kill started. Now, some more initials to confuse you with. CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, has released this information. There were two outbreaks of infectious salmon anemia at fish farms in Newfoundland that coincide with this fish kill. One happened on September the 6th, the other on September the 11th. Now, salmon anemia is a viral disease, and here and now has just learned that Northern Harvest had two such outbreaks, one on the 6th, those fish were harvested, also another one on the 11th, more salmon anemia was detected. Again, all the fish harvested, 120,000 fish. Now, it's unclear if this was anywhere near where the troubled fish were, but company spokesman Jason Card reminded CBC that ISA poses no risk to human health. However, Neither the company nor Mr. Card mentioned this outbreak at their Friday news conference. Uh, interesting thing about Jason Card, he used to work closely with cabinet ministers like Jerry Byrne. Mr. Card was Premier Dwight Ball's communications director until the summer, and if reporters like me wanted to speak to Jerry Byrne after question period, we would have to put that request in with Jason Card. Now, Jerry Byrne is the one with the questions, and a big one is, after Mr. Byrne chose to sit on the information about all the dying fish and wait for Northern Harvest to decide when to tell Newfoundland and Labrador, why did the company blindside the minister with an extra 600,000 dead salmon on Friday? And uh, this cleanup, this was going on for weeks before either the company or Jerry Byrne let the rest of us know. Meanwhile, this kind of cleanup, that's still ongoing. The election now with the big day just one week away, some newer Canadians are still getting used to the idea of choice. There was an interfaith event held in St. John's this weekend, an open house where candidates answered questions about the living wage, refugees and discrimination. Organizers wanted the group to warm up to the democratic process and get a closer look at the candidates because not everyone has ever submitted a ballot before. So many members of even our community, they have not seen elections. They have, you know, coming from different parts of the world where most of them are dictators. So there, here, actually, they get used to it. They should get used to it. That this is the exercise we do, and this is how we elect our, uh, you know, uh, parliamentarians. Well, seven of the ten candidates running in St. John's East and St. John's South Mount Pearl were present, and after the Q&A, they mingled with the people who came out to meet with them all.
My name is Chess Sweet Apple. Six years ago, I was picking berries and I got lost. We're checking back in with people whose lives have changed in an instant. I never, never did give up hope. Never did. And he said, it was the mountains in Grand Falls. I want to let you know we found your husband. And froze. And to see where they are today. I'm out in the garden all day long. Chess Sweet Apple, coming up on Here and Now. Well, it's the crown jewel of the airport in Gander, and it is one step closer to being open for the entire world to see. It's been mostly sealed off for decades, but the International Lounge at Gander International is a designer's dream, full of furniture and art straight from 1959. Heritage officials call it the single most important modernist room in Canada. As part of the airport's plan to get it open to the public again, it's now looking for a design company to refurbish the room and create a self-guided tour for visitors. The lounge should be open for visitors by next summer. Well, Prince William and his wife Kate have kicked off a five-day tour of Pakistan amid fanfare and very tight security. The royal couple was welcomed by Prime Minister Imran Khan in the country's capital, Islamabad. During their visit, the Duke and Duchess planned to focus on climate change and improving access to education for girls. Authorities have ramped up security by deploying more than 1,000 police as well as paramilitary units. This is the first trip to the country by members of the royal family in more than a decade. The Queen attended a special service today at one of London's oldest and most historic sites. The 93-year-old monarch was at Westminster Abbey to celebrate the 750th anniversary of the cathedral. It was built on the site of an earlier church, one that stood almost 1,000 years ago. I thought the basilica was old. Elizabeth and dozens of other kings and queens have been crowned here. Many also married and baptized, and the church remains a major tourist draw. It's home to the caskets of a dozen royals and famous Britons such as Isaac Newton and Charles Dickens. A million people visit these somber halls every year. In international news, in uh, war zones right now, Canada has decided to suspend weapon sales to Turkey. This after Turkish military forces invaded northeastern Syria last week. The United Nations says at least 11 children have been killed on both sides and at least 160,000 people have fled the mostly Kurdish area of northeastern Syria. The CBC's Margaret Evans spoke with some of them at a refugee camp across the border from Iraq. We're in a refugee camp in northern Iraq, which is about an hour's drive away from the Iraqi-Syrian border. The people in the camp arrived just yesterday. So we've been talking to people about what's been happening on the other side in northern Syria. Most of the people here came from the two villages or Syrian towns that were targeted by the Turkish offensive in the early days of the conflict. They talked about the airstrikes. They talked about shelling from uh, Syrian militia who were supporting the Turkish offensive, making the decision to flee with their families. Uh, long days on the road, they came with nothing but the clothes on their backs, and they had to pay smugglers to get them across the border, uh, dipping into their savings because despite the talk of solidarity between Iraq's Kurds and the Syrian Kurds, the border between these two regions is still not open. If you ask them about what's happening now, about the entry into the conflict of the Syrian regime, the government forces from Damascus coming in at the request of Kurdish militias in the north. They say they don't know if that was the right decision. Ask them about the Americans' decision to leave. They say it cost them dearly. And as one father told me, a father of three here, it has broken our backs. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Northern Iraq. Well, it's getting dark earlier and earlier. We're looking at some fog and showers tonight. We've got some clearing though and another storm on the way as we head towards the weekend. I'll have all the details coming up.
Well, it's getting closer. Canadians vote in just under a week, and the polls at this point suggest that no party will win a majority of the seats. And that has some of the leaders adjusting their message. Senior parliamentary reporter Julie Van Dusen has been following this story for us, and she joins us once again from Ottawa. Julie, what is Justin Trudeau saying today? Well, he was campaigning in the Maritimes, specifically in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and he won all the seats in that area and in PEI and in Newfoundland, Labrador. But will it happen again? Uh, everyone says unlikely. So his main pitch is the same here as it is everywhere in this area. Um, vote specifically to progressive voters. These are voters that would be maybe be voting NDP or Green. Vote for me because I've got the best chance of beating Andrew Scheer. Take a listen. In terms of the NDP and the Greens, remember this. If you want a progressive action, you need a progressive government, not a progressive opposition. Voting Liberal is the only way to stop Conservative cuts. Now, Julie, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh said today that he would not work with a Conservative government if there's a minority government. That's right. He said that in the past couple of days and again today because he just doesn't really like their pitch uh, about uh, cutting services and so on, or that's how he sees it. Now, it's interesting, Anthony, because he actually has the wind in his sails. He's been picking up votes uh, basically a point a day for the last week. Uh, so um, he is making a pitch to voters to say, look, uh, we have the momentum. Vote with your hearts. Don't listen to Justin Trudeau. Vote as many NDP MPs as you can into the House of Commons. They will keep your promises. Take a listen. When it comes to pharmacare, 22 years of liberal broken promises. When it comes to childcare, 26 years of broken promises. They don't deliver on pharmacare. They don't deliver on childcare. We're going to make sure we deliver for people. All right. Now, what about Andrew Scheer? Well, I don't know if he has blinders on or if he knows something we don't know, but he's not paying attention to the polls. He is predicting he will win a majority. And it's really hard to say who he would work with if he had a minority, certainly not the NDP. Today he was uh, dumping on the Bloc Québécois, saying that if they get into the House with a lot of seats, they'll push for a referendum. Right now he's acting as if he could win a majority and planning his first 100 days as Prime Minister. Take a listen. There is now a clear choice between our party and an NDP Liberal coalition, which will raise taxes, uh, kill jobs, drive out investment, cancel big projects. Uh, I know Canadians won't want that to happen, and that's why I'm very optimistic for October 21st. Right. So, I mean, if we do get a minority government on Monday, that government will need the help of other parties to stay afloat. And if it doesn't get that, well, Anthony will be heading back to the polls before you know it. Okay, maybe yes. I don't know what to say about that. I know how much work it is to cover an election in the first place, so uh, we'll just find out what Canadians decide. Julie, thank you very much. You're welcome. That's our senior reporter, Julie Van Dusen, in our Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. So this is, the first ex this is the first election you've done in Newfoundland, right? It is, yeah. Because everybody, what's great, so in six days, everybody wants to know the weather, right? <laughs> Especially yes. the parties, because then they That's start planning, true. okay? Because it actually affects turnout. It totally right? does. Yeah, it definitely. You excited? Is. I am very excited. Right. Your <laughs> election excited. forecast right here and here and now. Stay That's tuned. Right, yeah. Count the start a countdown clock. <laughs> Where do you want to start? Uh, let's start on Thursday. Okay. A couple days from now, it's already Tuesday, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Thursday we're gonna see. Is that payday? Uh, sure. Is okay. it? <laughs> You tell me. Uh, but yeah, temperatures are going to uh, start to climb a little bit. We're going to sit uh, around 13 degrees for Cornerbrook, Grand Falls, Windsor, similar, and then 10 degrees for St. John's. But you'll see, we're going to start to see some rain move in, and that's ahead of the next system. Uh, that's moving in flurries. It looks like will be the story for Lab City. You're hanging on to some cooler temperatures and then some sunshine up through Nain and uh, Cartwright, mostly cloudy skies and 11 degrees. Now here's the setup. So I showed you this a little bit earlier. We've got uh, rain moving through for us, clearing skies. And then uh, if I zoom out a little bit, the next weather maker isn't, hasn't formed yet, but will uh, in the coming days. It's going to form actually pretty quickly. So we've got a low pressure system moving over Ontario and some shower activity down through the southern states. Those are going to merge if you take a look at the uh, future tracker. So there's all that rain. The two systems merge and uh, strengthen. We call it uh, it's basically a weather bomb where it drops uh, the low pressure rapidly over 24 hours. So 
Whether it actually becomes a weather bomb or not, uh, we'll have to check that out. But over the next couple of days, the system will organize. It's going to bring some rain and heavy winds to the Maritime Provinces first on the day on Thursday. And then overnight, as that wind starts to make its way or the system starts to make its way towards us, the uh, winds really ramp up, especially in the uh, rec house area where we're looking at gusts likely in excess of 100 kilometers per hour. So if you are planning on traveling, definitely keep that in mind. Uh, and then we're going to see some rain and winds spread across the province as we head into overnight and into Friday morning. So uh, those temperatures are actually going to climb quite nicely uh, with this system as well. We're looking at about 10 degrees by Thursday, Friday, uh, 16 degrees. Ignore those uh, letters there. They didn't save on me, but we're looking at uh, 13 degrees for uh, Saturday with rain on Sunday. And then for central Newfoundland, again, there's that rain for you. 18 degrees, it looks like 12 by the time Saturday rolls around. So we're going to dip back down back to seasonal by the time uh, Sunday rolls around, looking at about nine degrees. And then the, again, with these winds, we're looking at winds likely between uh, 50 to 70 kilometers per hour for most of us and then generally staying gray through Sunday as we uh, see those temperatures dip as well. So for Eastern Labrador, uh, nine degrees tomorrow and then hovering around those single digits for the rest of the week, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And then for Western Labrador, unfortunately, those temperatures are going to stay quite cool. We're looking at about three degrees, anywhere from really two to four degrees uh, for the rest of the week with some snow, light snow on Friday as of now, and then Sunday looks like the best chance of showers, uh, rather sunshine and three degrees. Well, actually, lots of news involving the weather right around the world. Search and rescue efforts continue in Japan, where dozens of people have died after the worst typhoon in decades. The country is struggling to recover three days after being walloped by a super typhoon. Winds, torrential rains caused massive flooding, as 20 rivers burst their banks, homes crushed, thousands without power. There are more than 60 reported deaths so far. Hundreds are injured and many are still missing. The government is calling it a catastrophic, a catastrophic disaster. Schools are closed and flights delayed as Indonesia battles toxic haze from forest fires. Large parts of the country are battling out of control forest fires and six provinces have declared states of emergency. The smoke is so thick it's causing widespread health problems and now even the army is involved with trying to help firefighters. Recent efforts include dropping tons of salt into the clouds hoping to trigger rain. The fires are often deliberately set to clear land for logging and to help out the palm oil industry. Well, here at home, climate change is proving especially damaging for coastal regions with erosion a growing concern. And Quebec's Magdalen Islands are among the most vulnerable. The CBC's Sarah Levitt went to see the damage caused there by two powerful storms within just one year. The Magdalen Islands are known for their beautiful landscapes and unique location. Almost 13,000 people call this archipelago home. Smack dab in the middle of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, residents rely on the sea. The two main industries are fishing and tourism, but the island life, which holds such an appeal, is also a curse. The uh, climate change has been very difficult in the last few years. In less than 10 months, two storms hit the islands, a windstorm in November, then post-tropical storm Dorian last month. The erosion, uh, est un phénomène naturel. The Magdalen Islands have always been eroding, he says, except with climate change, everything is happening a lot more quickly, more violently. The islands are sinking as sea levels are rising and the ice that acts as a buffer along the coast is disappearing. Add unpredictable storms and it makes for ever-shifting landscapes. We had one storm and literally it just went and we saw the erosion going so fast. We used to have about 19 meters of sand dune and in two storms, one bigger than the other, nothing. So we went from having that beautiful sand dune protection to nothing, completely naked. After Dorian, this section of a popular coastal path disintegrated. Its proximity to the island's only hospital and the downtown core worries many. Also troubling is the condition of Route 199. The road is very important because that's, uh, like I said, it's the link to the, all the, the islands of the, uh, the village of the islands. It also connects residents with electricity.
I'm on Chemin des Chalets, a popular place for cottages. Now this street used to go straight through there, but now there's a cottage here. When Dorian hit, the waters swept it onto the road. Now the municipality is saying people can no longer stay here. Dozens of cottages need to be moved or torn down. Yet some island residents know the risks and take them anyway. 30 years, I lost uh, 75 feet. Solomon had his cottage moved inland, away from the crumbling coast. Stay in the mountains is bad because we will have the place. Stay near the, the sea, it's attractive, but we have to pay for it. Residents know they're no match for an increasingly angry mother nature. Still, many refuse to leave the islands, an idyllic place they say will always be their home. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, the Magdalen Islands. Fall is in full swing. Take a look at these beautiful colors. Uh, Bernice Gowdy sent us this great shot. I'll tell you where this is too. Uh, this is West Coast, right? No, it's not. Really? Yeah. South? No. North? <laughs> Labrador? You'll get it. Laurentians. <laughs> Welcome back to Here Now. Well, if you're of a certain age, remember cartoons, you might remember an episode of Bugs Bunny where Elmer Fudd said, be very, very quiet. When you're sneaking up on your prey, you gotta be careful or you won't get it. Check this out. A hungry shark caused quite the commotion trying to rustle up some fish in the shallow waters off the coast of Florida. All the shark wants is a quick nibble, but there you go. That is one fast school of fish. Check this out again. They disperse so quickly. What does a shark get? Nutting. After several attempts, the shark gets a failing grade. The power of numbers. Check that out. <laughs> that is insane. Isn't that something? And that's a large school of fish. You'd think you'd be able to get one. Wow. Worst shark in the world. <laughs> He's not very good at hunting now, is he? <laughs> you can try again, I think. I mean, just the fish just, uh, you know, there are so many so of us, we'll just confuse them.
Yeah. When do you think you'd be able to get Maybe one? It's going towards him now. Wow. Incredible, huh? That's great footage. Swimming with the fishes. No, I wouldn't want to be swimming with those. Not ones. with it. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, your picture? Sure. Okay, let's take a look. Beautiful. We got so many gorgeous photos uh, this weekend. I'm sure everybody was out and about, especially on uh, Sunday with that beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. temperatures. But uh, yeah, so this picture was taken in Trinity. Probably one of the most photographed communities on the island. Yeah, and it's with a reason. I was going to say, there that. is an absolute Isn't reason for it. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous colors. Look at those oranges there and the reds. I think we're pretty close to uh, peak. peak. I think you're right. I think it feels that way, yeah. Yeah. One, yeah. one big rainfall and away and they the go. And the wind, I know. But you know, you mentioned Northeast earlier, yeah, right? A nor nor'easter. A nor'easter. Yeah. Uh, you know, even last year, though, when I was here, uh, or when I first started, I figured, you know, we had a couple pretty strong fall storms right in the beginning, so I assumed some of those leaves would fall off, but yeah. I don't know, it may be a little bit too early for that. Okay. For the, you know, a little, hanging the significant, on. yeah, they're hanging on just a little yeah. bit longer. It's going to hang on a little longer <laughs> for the tourists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't forget, tomorrow here now, a very popular segment. This is our story. We've got another installment for that for you, and whenever we have those on... Uh, the reaction's fantastic, and tomorrow's mm -hmm. story is great, so please tune in if you can, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll see you then. Mm -hmm. Good night.